Hey designers, we're back with another case study video and in this one I'm taking you behind the scenes so that you can see all the nitty gritty chaos that goes into developing a full brand identity for a boutique clothing brand. Let's jump in. Right, so I'm gonna break this video up into three parts. We're gonna hit the strategy and discovery part where I'm gonna talk you through how we developed a proper vision and personality for the brand. We're gonna to touch on how we did that. The second phase is gonna be the design phase where I'm gonna show you my Illustrator artboard and all the delightful mess that's included in there and how we actually eventually got to the logo. You're gonna to wanna to stick around for that part because I changed everything at the last minute. <laughs> And then in the final phase, I'm going to show you how we applied all of the design elements to all of the collateral and then move towards creating sort of art direction for photography and planning what we were going to do with the basic Shopify website that she was going to launch right at the end of the project. So stick around and let's jump in. Before we get into the process of the video and I start jumping straight into the brand strategy and discovery phase, I want to introduce you a little bit to the client. So. Natalie came to me at the beginning of last year looking to revamp or create from scratch the brand identity for her new boutique clothing brand. Now, the journey to creating this boutique clothing brand was quite interesting. She is an avid golfer and on a golf trip, she stumbled across the fact that her and a couple of her friends were struggling to find golf wear that was resonating with the style they wanted to sort of exist in so they really were looking for clothing that was a bit more classy athleisure that was tailored well fitted classic stylish and sort of very long lasting and she was actually really struggling to find items that she liked and so being the ambitious and creative woman that she was she decided to create her own and thus in the rb was born and she came to me looking to establish a more clear brand direction and voice for this brand. She wanted it to have a professional look and feel, and she wanted it to be able to be presented to wholesalers and direct consumers in a nice professional way. So we jumped on a discovery call and she chatted me through all of these ideas. And in our discussions, I realized she'd already done a huge amount of work to establishing a brand story and vision for the business. But there were a couple of gaps. And so I suggested to her that we do a comprehensive strategy process where we discover the heart of the brand, we work out what that message is really gonna be, and we work out what the sort of pillars of the brand personality are gonna be, and how we're gonna present ARB to the world in a way that's gonna resonate with the right customer. Um, you know, we want to build a loyal, solid following. We don't necessarily want to go viral. We just want a nice, solid brand that's going to stand the test of time. So she agreed and we booked in the project. And when it came time for the discovery and strategy process, we actually broke down the strategy process into, I think it was three or four different sessions. And I structured it a little bit differently to what I normally do in the sense that I structured it as almost three to four coaching sessions where I worked one-on-one -on -one with her through all these various exercises to develop collaboratively the ideas with her. So, you know, we discussed the why of the brand together. We discussed the personality of the brand together. We went through all the standard exercises that I usually take my clients through in strategy and discovery processes, but the structure was a bit different. Nancy was the type of client who was very well educated on these things and so I didn't want to necessarily talk at her just for the sake of the fact that that was how I do things and I really wanted it to feel collaborative. I wanted her to feel like she was learning about how to build a brand and she was learning about how to interact with brands and I really wanted to be a part of helping her do that and so I took on this role of a bit of a brand coach and together we developed a comprehensive strategy for the Indie Arby brand, which we've now had almost a year to start implementing and getting the story out there. And so far, the reception has been really good. So let's jump over into the strategy document we created. Now, for anybody who's seen any of my previous case study videos, you'll recognize immediately that the strategy document looks very different to what I usually do. And there's a reason for that. 
there was a lot of information in this strategy document. This is one of the most comprehensive discovery and strategy sessions I'd ever done. And I wanted a slightly easier, simpler format to use. What we did is we just kept it type-based and you can see that we flew through all of these different exercises and we wrote down a bunch of interesting things. One of the things that was the most important for us, and I'm going to stick here on this one, was creating the LERB customer persona. So we wanted to work out who the ideal LERB woman was and who the LERB persona was. So you know, the customer and the brand talking to each other, what were those two personalities? And we spoke about this a lot and we ended up with this manifestation of timeless class meets modern lifestyle, refined yet authentic, independent and ambitious with a twinkle in her eye. Her warmth is magnetic and her zest for life infectious. She's many things, forever involving, creative, courageous, she's vulnerable, she's an army woman. And so we really want to create this boutique feel where this wasn't just a clothing brand. This was a movement. This was, you know, a quiet, gentle move to celebrate all that women are and all that Nancy, the founder, is. She is a very dynamic, very multifaceted and talented woman. And we really wanted the brand to speak to other women who love doing lots of different things and, you know, really value timeless style they want to dress classic they want to feel confident and they want to feel equipped to sort of move throughout their day with ease not having to stress about what they're wearing not having to stress about looking good they know that if they chuck on an LERB piece they're going to look good no matter what so that was kind of the whole idea around that and so we've got a couple of different elements here in terms of the brand's promise brand's most loved trait and brand's goal and we really wanted to position the brand as a person so Ellie Arby is a person she is a woman in and of herself and so we really positioned the strategy in that way and we went through this entire process we've created a whole bunch of different things as well as a strategic positioning statement for her to state where she was going to fit in the market so that we could make sure that we were designing effectively. So in that, we had sort of what makes her different, who she's for, what she's known for, and kind of the various words that we were going to be using throughout the creation of the brand process. Now, the brand strategy inevitably has evolved a little bit over the last year as we've worked with the brand. I have actually continued to work with Natalie on the brand and its sort of voice, um, and it's been lovely to watch it adapt. And I think it must be noted that brands are adaptable and they should be a solid core foundation on which everything revolves. But brands grow just as people do. And I think it's important that as a business owner, there is a level of education. If you are doing brand strategy and brand development with clients, help them understand how brands work. Help them understand how to work with their evolving brand. How not to just copy paste a, a rule from a style guide, how to understand what that is and so that they can use it and move with it as a business owner and be equipped to work with their brand going forward. Um, and that doesn't mean that it eliminates your role. It just means that the business owner doesn't obliterate the beautiful work you've done. It just means they can work confidently with it. So that was the strategy phase and this led us into the creative direction phase where we now start putting these beautiful words into images and working out how the brand should look and feel and show up on the shelves and on the customers themselves. So bear in mind during this process, the product development had already begun. So her and I were chatting a lot about what the products looked like, what fabrics she was using, etc. And Here's the beautiful thing is, is that as we moved through this process, sort of as we defined the creative direction and the color pattern, all of those things, Natalie actually went ahead and resampled all of her original pieces into the brand color palette. That is how powerful branding can be because originally she had a color palette that was totally different and now she's got the color palette that fits beautifully with this brand and says what it means to say to its customers. And so... That's the interesting thing about this process is, is that this phase can really influence everything. And so it was beautiful to watch that happen. 
But let's jump into the creative direction and I'll show you what we ended up doing in terms of the visual look and feel. Okay, so let's jump into what developed after the strategy phase, which was the creative direction. And creative direction is one of the most critical parts of the design process. And this is the part where ironically, I spend a lot of time with the client. And the reason being is instead of presenting 300 different logo ideas to my client, we hash out the look and feel in mood board format before I move into design. This allows me the confidence and the clarity to move into design to know which logo styles my client resonates with. Have we discussed why it's going to work? Have we discussed the color palette that we think is going to resonate? You know, have we looked at textures, illustrations, emblem styles, etc., fonts, all of those things. We can discuss all of that beforehand and I can use mood boards to educate my clients about what certain fonts work for what certain situations so that when it comes to them looking at the logo presentation, they are actually equipped with practical knowledge about how design works for their brand. And now this is critical because as a professional creative, your job is to take your client on a journey. They do not oftentimes understand what goes into these processes. And so really it is your role to help them learn about this process and to give them the type of experience which makes them feel comfortable and confident. Because without that, they're going to doubt everything. You know what it's like to walk into a space that you know nothing about and the nerves and you asking all these questions because you're unsure or you don't ask any questions at all and you sit quietly and wait and then you walk away with a solution that you're not happy with. Anybody who's been for a haircut and has been too shit scared to say anything to the hairdresser <laughs> that you don't like your haircut and so you leave with a haircut that you don't like, I've been there. <laughs> So the point is you want to get to a point with your client where they feel comfortable and confident enough to question your decisions as a designer politely and respectfully. So anybody who's been for a haircut and has not liked the end result but has been too scared to say anything to your hairdresser <laughs> and you leave with a horrible haircut that you don't like because you were too scared to say anything, you didn't feel confident enough. And that's how your clients might feel sometimes if they are not equipped with the clarity and the confidence or the security in their relationship with you as the designer to say something about how they feel. You risk a client walking away with a result they don't actually like because they don't feel comfortable. And while some of us might sit and go, okay, well, that's the client's fault. There is a lot that you can do as the creative professional to make them feel comfortable. And the creative direction phase is one of my favorite phases to do that. So we jumped into the creative direction presentation by explaining to the client why this step is super important. I then touched a little quick summary on the brand again. Um, this is straight from the strategy. And then I focused on what we are creating. So what are we after with the creative concept? What are we trying to do here? Because we want to make sure that anytime we're presenting something creative, which can very easily become subjective, that we are anchoring it on something practical like the strategy or the story you're trying to tell so that it can be contextualized within that. You also want to avoid your clients sort of changing their minds halfway through. So you, you want to be able to hash all of this out now. So what I ended up doing was presenting three slightly different concepts to her. And these were all designed to pull out a certain focus. So this first one was focused very much on the editorial look. It had these big, tall serif fonts, bold blues, texture, strength, structure, all of those things. Um, and it was very focused on ambitious women. So it was a little bit stronger and it had a little bit more weight to it. The second direction was old school, refined, classy. So this was sort of a little bit more old money. It was a little bit more Hollywood glamour and it was a little bit more muted in terms of its color tones, a little bit more focused on the neutrals, less bold color. And then we had our elegant look. And this one was an interesting one for me because even in the strategy phase, we discussed that she didn't want the brand to be feminine. I wanted to double check 
Now, it's funny because often, you know, a client will say to you, oh, well, I don't want it to look bold or I want bold. And you go, well, what does that mean? <laughs> what does bold mean? What does it look like? What does it feel like? And so she'd said she doesn't want it to look feminine. And I went, okay, but this can technically be construed as elegant rather than feminine. So I wanted to check and I'm glad I did because there was actually a bunch of elements in this mood board she liked and it was like, okay, cool. Now that's clear. So we went through this whole process where I gave her these three concepts, explained some of the examples and kind of the focus points. And she came back with a bunch of feedback and we actually spent sort of the middle phase of this part of the project, hashing out different looks and feels, pulling out things that we really liked and trying to blend the two concepts. And we went back and forwards quite a lot in this phase. And it was really important because I think we had nothing to anchor onto. So we had no baseline and it was, you know, we had no existing brand to work off of or to refine. We were really working from scratch on this one. So it was really important that we get clarity very early on. And I was happy to add an additional round or time into the creative direction phase. But ironically, we didn't actually need that time. And by the time we got to sort of round three of the creative direction, we'd ended up with basically two concepts that we were very happy with and we were going to try and blend them. So I wanted to create two directions based on the back and forwards that we'd done. Option A which had its own focus and option B, which was very, very similar, but it had a more of a muted look with straight lines on the packaging and a little bit more of sort of a, yeah, a warmer look. She ended up going for this concept with a blend of sort of the strength of the packaging of the second one. So this was definitely the one that was chosen. And then I compared them for easy sort of reference for her. So the right-hand side one also had the hand-drawn illustrations, which she wanted. So we ended up creating a sort of a blended mood board, which I'll show you when I move into the design phase. Um, We actually ended up sort of blending the two. And then we also talked about patterns and illustrations. And this is a nice thing to do inside the mood board. Now, often I find within these nine squares, it can be difficult to actually represent all of it, but it's a nice way to get an overview. And then what I actually do is I expand the creative direction and we talk about things like pattern styling are we going to do vector illustrations or are we going to do fully organic hand-drawn illustrations we ended up doing a mixture of both ironically um, and took a little bit of tweaking and sort of refining but it worked really nicely so it was hand-drawn but vectorized if that makes sense so you'll see that in the design phase shortly and so we ended up chatting about that and we jumped on a call and we hashed it all out and we spoke about the various elements that were working really well She actually, in this phase, mentioned to me that she wanted to see blue. And I was a bit nervous about that at first. And I was like, okay, well, we'll have to see. But in the second mood board or or the final mood board that we created, I managed to bring in a bit of the deep blue from the initial concept on this mood board here. And it actually worked really beautifully. And I was very happy. And this is the magic about working collaboratively with your clients, because You know, as a creative, you have preconceived ideas in your head off of things that you've seen before or whatever, and it can be difficult for you to cut your own bias out of the picture. And sometimes your client's little ideas are worth trying because it might not work exactly as they've suggested, but it might spur something on for you and you might come up with something really cool and interesting as a result. And that's exactly what happened here. So we ended up moving forward with the mood board on the left. Um, with a little bit of option B and a bit of blue and it ended up being a really great foundation for the design phase. So let's jump into my illustrator board and I'll show you the behind the scenes of the design process. Okay so we are jumping straight into my illustrator art board for the logo development process of the LERB brand and as you saw in the mood board and creative direction process we went through quite a few iterations of the mood board itself And so we ended up with sort of this extended mood board, which was a blend of a different couple of different concepts and things that we really wanted to capture within the brand. So I pulled this into Illustrator as I always do and started off by pulling out a couple of colors because I really wanted to sort of see what we were working with. 
And really in the beginning, we were leaning very much towards this sort of foresty green color. But you'll see as we develop that we moved away from that color quite quickly. Um, but anyway, I did what I always do and I jumped into trying to load in a bunch of fonts. Now, let me explain my thinking for this process first. When I was thinking about the logo, I was thinking about all of these like super high luxury brands, but I didn't want the logo to not have any personality. Now, I am definitely one of those designers who is against this whole blending movement where logos these days have got no character at all. I understand that they're legible and flexible and blah, 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 and great fonts and all that stuff. But I will always be a lover of a personality-filled, interesting logo. <laughs> so, um, and I think there's really beautiful ways to do that. So I really wanted Eddie Arby to have a logo that felt classic and classy and felt a little bit old money, old school, um, but still had a modern touch to it. I, I, we wanted the brand to have a very classic and feminine look, but we didn't want it to look outdated. So it was a very interesting balance to play with. And instinctively, I was just hooked on this typography, this honet, I don't know how you say that, so pardon me if I'm saying it wrong, but Basically, this typography over here was the main focus for me in my head. I knew that I wanted this sort of semi-serif, um, wide-based or wide-set font because I wanted that space and that elegance and that presence. Um, but when I started playing with the fonts, I just sort of kept getting irritated because the words Eliabi themselves, like while they looked good, it looked too masculine. So I was looking at these fonts and I was going, okay, I'm going to have to see what I can do about trying to balance the look. The other thing I really wanted to bring in was sort of this, um, I wanted it there to be a script element, but I didn't want it to be overkill. I wanted it to be very subtle. Um, the signature look, it was not going to be a main feature. It was just sort of going to be a little bit of an accent. Um, definitely not a priority for the brand. Um, Natalie really wanted a bit more structure. She wanted the brand to have strength and character as opposed to looking girly. So we wanted feminine elegance without it being girly. So we wanted soft illustrations, but they needed to be quite classy. So this was all the sort of the dichotomy of various elements that I was playing with. So we jumped straight in. And now usually in this phase, I've done a bit of sketching as well. For Ilya Arby, I'll be straight honest, I didn't pop into sketching straight away for this one. I actually wanted to find that font. So I came into Illustrator straight away to try and find the font first. And then because I knew I was going to bring Illustrated Elements in later on, I wanted to find that font. So I jumped in and started playing with this. And you can see I tried it in lowercase and it wasn't really working for me. And I tried this and it looked too like health brandy and it looked too playful. And I was like, no, that's not going to work. I then tried this lovely font here, which I think if I move myself out of the way is quite a nice one. So you, you'll find that there's like a lot of quite unexpected. Oh, this is a screenshot. That's why. <laughs> that's a screenshot. So I do this a lot. Like I'll go on to font foundries and things like that and I'll type in the font on their previews and screenshot it bring it into Illustrator to have a look at what it looks like before I purchase the font so sometimes you can't purchase or you can't download test versions of fonts and so it can be a little tricky to actually test what they look like in the proper wording of the logo so I like to take a screenshot and bring it into Illustrator to come and see now under no circumstances please design this if you're new to this do not screenshot, image trace that screenshot and then use that as the logo, please. I beg of you. <laughs> Don't do that. It's not allowed. Um, there are plenty of situations where image trace can be super helpful, but that is not one of them. So don't do that. I've been very tempted in the early days of my design career when fonts were like super expensive. Um, but remember that you can also chat to your clients about paying for fonts um, so you can discuss that with them at some stage. I then happened across this font here, which was starting to get a little closer to the vision I had in mind originally. I was definitely quite interested in it. I was very curious about it. So I sort of had that there, I expanded it out and then I sort of played with some of the characters a bit. And then you can see here that I started bringing it in to play with it a little bit with the tailored athleisure 
uh, subtitle which we were going to use for the brand. So I played with that for a bit and then it just didn't feel right. It was it was still feeling too masculine. It was feeling too strong. And I really needed there to be some elegance, some softness to it. It was missing. It was also feeling a little too equestrian. And I, it's a very difficult sort of thing to try and explain. But I kept thinking of equestrian and English countryside, which was not really the vibe we were going for. So I was like, okay, I've got to modernize this somehow, but without losing anyway. So I started playing with slightly more elegant fonts. And I came over this way to look at sort of, instead of going wide, going tall and bringing in that sort of romance in that way. Um, and so I tried it in lowercase and you can see I like copy and paste in the mood board like a hundred million times all over the place so that I have to keep like dashing around the artboard looking for references. But you can see here that I started working with the E and the A and I thought, you know, I spent a whole bunch of time like trying to make a custom B to try and bring in a bit more elegance. And like when I zoomed into this, I was like, okay, this is all right. Like, I don't mind this. I think this is quite nice. It's quite, it's got quite a statement. The Ellie particularly looked really sort of visually interesting. And I thought it looked quite statuesque and I thought it could be quite nice, but I was missing that organic element. And so I was trying to make a custom B here. Um, and then I thought, no, the bee looks a bit funny. So I moved on to just doing this um, and bringing in that vertical line or horizontal line, sorry. Didn't really love that that much, but I liked it enough to keep pushing it. So I then started working with the E and the A and I wanted to try and bring in like the swing of a, a golf club. And I was trying to bring in like the the folds or the heels of the green and all sorts of things like that, like a golf course and trying to make it look sporty in some way without it being like cringy and obvious. I really hate literal logos that are like super obvious. Like if it's for golf, then you've got a golf club in your logo. I, I'm the kind of person that really, I, I'm a bit more of a conceptual designer. I prefer things to have a bit more of a subtle feel than a literal representation of what you're talking about, even though there can be definitely times and places where that is super useful. So anyway, I started playing with these monograms and I moved around a bit. I was very heavily inspired by this design here with the overlapping and sort of the cutouts. And it was like, that would be quite nice, but the broken lines, I wasn't sure was going to work for this brand. Anyway, I do this a lot when I'm trying to test logo concepts. I'll bring in an image or a stock photo or something like that, that I imagine would be relevant for the brand. So in this case, it was a clothing shot. And I start putting the logo over the top of that to see what it looks like in context. Because while your clients also struggle to imagine what designs look like in the real world, I also sometimes struggle. And while I've got an idea in my head, it can be difficult to see what it looks like for real. I played with that a little bit and wasn't loving it, but I stuck with it a little. And then you can see here, I jumped over to this side and was like, okay, enough is enough. This font is not working. I'm going back to my little Honnet concept. Um, and again, sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Um, and I started bringing in a font that had a little bit more sort of the semi serif vibe going on. And then I went in and actually tweaked the letter forms to look a little bit more accentuated. It was like, okay, how am I going to bring something interesting to this typography? Now, don't, you don't need to force type to look interesting, okay? You can also just leave it. <laughs> if it's a beautiful font, you tweak the kerning and you get the composition right and that's totally fine. You don't have to force yourself to customize type just for the sake of it because what you'll end up doing is creating a complicated logo that doesn't need to be complicated. The reason why I was customizing this is I wanted the concept surrounding it was beautiful classic elements, elegance with a flair. So Natalie herself is one of these incredibly classy women. She's multi-talented. She's super passionate about lots of things, but she ha she's a firecracker. So she has lots of spice and she has lots of personality. And I wanted the brand to represent women like that. So it, it was definitely a, a girl's girl's brand. And it was supposed to be about, you know, 
celebrating wanting to be a bit more classy and reserved, but still have a little bit of spice and personality when you're comfortable and when it's necessary. So I wanted the logo to have that little flair in it. And so this is why I was trying to do the EA in like a nice, interesting way and the curves on the A. Um, and then I started going, okay, well, what if we moved away from the structured EA and into like a hand-drawn EA? And so I started sketching out these. Um, this started off as an illustration on my notebook and then I brought it into Illustrator to try and test it. Um, and you can see I tried all sorts of things and then I was like, okay, move away from the cursive. The cursive wasn't doing it. Like, let's move back to the structure. And so I came into the structure and I started trying to construct something that looked maybe like a tennis court or something along those lines. And I was just like, this is looking so bizarre. It's looking like a Japanese restaurant or something. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. It's gonna, it's gonna be construed completely incorrectly. Let's move away from this. I then sort of struck upon this where I, instead of bringing in a totally custom um, sort of stem or stroke or whatever to the typography, I decided to just soften out the corners a bit. And it created this very interesting look, which I quite liked, which reminded me sort of the soft edges of the clothing that she was designed, which is fully tailored, by the way. So it's properly tailored clothing but it's got like the softness to it in terms of the fabrics and so I was like okay so we'll go tailored structured font but we'll soften it with some curves so that we've got that feminine feel and then we'll have the tailored that legion and I did really like this I started playing with it and you can see I started popping it over images and looking at it and I really did think it looked quite nice like I was enjoying the look of it sort of bringing in the colors and then I was like wait I've got an idea and this idea came to me quite literally when I was making coffee one morning and I had been wrestling with this for days days and this is the interesting thing about this creative process is is that I always build in a buffer zone for myself because I know sometimes I can crack a logo in a day and sometimes it takes me three weeks now, obviously, I don't always have three weeks for a logo, so I'm going to have to try and like ramp up the process. But this project, for some reason, even though I was so connected to the client and even though I fully believed in the concept that we were developing and I, it was so clear in my head, the look that I was trying to get across, I just could not get the logo right. And it was driving me insane. So what I actually did was I stepped away from my desk for a day or two and I put the project down for a bit and I worked on a couple of other things and this struck me one morning while I was making coffee and I went I know what I'm going to do is I'm going to go for lowercase ea because they're the same shape <laughs> so I was like I know what I'm going to do so I quickly sketched it out on and I was looking for the sketch the other day and I couldn't find it but I sketched it out on a piece of paper there while the um Nespresso machine was busy making me a delicious cup of coffee and I struck upon this idea here and this is kind of where it began so it was this E within the A and then I decided to extend the stem out because it, it reminded me of a whole bunch of different things and then as I was sort of refining this shape it suddenly struck on me over here I went it looks it looks like a golf club and it also looks like a riding crop and it also looks like a bunch of other things looks like a hockey stick like <laughs> so I got very excited and was like oh look at me being subtle but literal <laughs> so anyway I got very excited about this idea and I was like this is perfect this is it this is the thing because I knew for an iconic clothing brand and sort of the boutique thing you need an emblem of some kind you need an emblem that's going to sit smack bang on the design and it's going to look amazing so this is what we ended up with um, we ended up with this monogram style emblem and you can see I here just moving through the the layout of it working out the spacing a bit um, and just fixing what the actual EA looks like um, so you can see I'm tweak 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 and my tip that I always leave for anybody who's watched any of the videos that I've made before copy paste copy paste copy paste so take a copy paste it in make your changes 
and then leave the original so that you can go back if you need to. And anyway, then I brought in the type and I was like, okay, now we're talking. Now we're getting close. We've got this EA symbol, which looks great. It's got a, you know, there's a whole symbolism behind it. You know, it's got the golf stick. It's got the riding crop. It's got everything that represents the sort of the sports that Natalie really wanted to focus on for the range. Golf, etc. I then whacked it into this outline and popped it into an embossing mocker to have a look at what it would look like nicely embossed. And I was like, okay, we're very close. We're very close. I'm liking it a lot. So then I started playing with what you could do with the monogram in terms of making it super large and using the big shape. I brought in the sort of the corners to match the typography, made some of the edges wider to fit the font um, so that the monogram really, despite being lowercase, fit with the actual main font. And I started tweaking, you know, what does it look like in black and white with this all black and cream? I then started playing with it in color, with the water, started playing it with image sort of renderings like this. I could wrap the EA around the model and then started looking at various ways to play with the logo. And then I did this interesting thing where I tried to make a pattern out of the emblem. And in making a pattern out of the emblem, I struck upon a delightfully happy accident, which was this symbol right here and it was a tri triple repeat of the main emblem and it created this flipping epic monogram symbol emblem for the logo and I just went that's it that's it it's done it's perfect it's amazing it reminded me of golf balls it reminded me of tennis rackets it reminded me of riding crafts golf clubs and it also just had this very cool like infinity abstract look to it it patterned really well it, I was very happy so I knew that that was it so we stuck with that and you can see now I started pushing it then I jumped into my iPad and I started doing the illustrations because we knew we wanted some organic illustrations so I drew these out on my iPad and brought them in and I started playing with them over there and then you can see here, I'm now starting to play with the designs that I want to present to her. So I start doing this inside Illustrator where I create all of the different variations of the pattern. So I did a embossed pattern and this is when I was starting to get really excited about the look of the brand. And I was still playing with the green at this stage. Um, you can see I started doing some faded art things. This is where I brought in the script font. So here we were trying a couple of different phrases. Um, and I started looking at a label for inside the clothing, like at the back. Um, I started looking at what that might look like. I then had a complete mental breakdown and woke up the next day after doing all of this going, I did the full logo presentation for her. So I put out the entire thing and then I went, it's not right. It's not right. <laughs> I don't like it. It's not right. That uppercase is too strong. It's too masculine. It's too bold. It looks too much like I'm trying to be Balenciaga or something like that. I just went, that is not what Eli Arby is. Eli Arby is classic and elegant, but soft-spoken and encouraging and positive. And it didn't feel right. And this was the day I was supposed to present to her. And I went, what am I going to do? because I don't, I don't like it and I want to change it. So I literally at, I think it was 8.15 that morning, I sat down and I went, what am I going to do? And I hit the drawing board and I went, I'm going to fix it. And I can't work out exactly where the idea hit me, but I think it was here somewhere where I went, I'm going lowercase. So first of all, I had to try and find a base font that was similar to the EA shape that I'd started creating. And I managed to find sort of this one, which um, I think I've customized. And like, I think one of the two or three of the letters I actually created myself, but I went lowercase. And immediately I was like, okay, that feels way better. I'm much happier with that. 
I initially played with sort of extending out the E on the various letters to have a look at what that looked like, but it felt just like it was too much. It felt like I was pushing it a little bit. You can see here I was starting with the badges. See, I did all of these mock-ups. This one over here where I was doing this and I was trying all sorts of different things with the logo just on its own and then as a badge like this and then eventually just went no. And then landed on this version of the logo here where it's just a beautiful, simple, minorly customized with our little L's and our B over here just to make sure that it fits and it's got its own character, its own personality, it's subtle, it just works and it's not overly complicated. And now I was happy. So now I raced through to try and create the presentation. And of course, in the pattern making, realized this green is driving me nuts. The green is so obvious for a golf brand. And I was like, what can I do that's different? So I went back to all of our mood boards and realized that a lot of the conversation we'd been having was about this beautiful deep blue. And I went, that's the one. So as soon as I paired the deep blue with the quadrupled emblem, the new typeface, and I updated the typeface for the slogan, I went, yay. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> We've got it. I then started updating the badges to have um, this script font as well. I mean, this uh, serif font as well, which looked so much nicer. Um, and it just looked a little bit different. It looked a bit more unique. It wasn't like your typical badge that you see. The logo on the blue just looked amazing. I then started like layering up all of the illustrations and creating the various patterns that I was going to use and moved along to mocking all sorts of different things up and playing with it. You can see here, I even tried making little golf carts, which they were too way too playful for the brand, but you can see there. Um, started putting these next to the mood board and realized that those color tonalities were perfect. Um, started playing with the typography a little bit more in terms of looking at different ways that I was going to write the catchphrases and things like that for the dynamic modern woman. What I was going to do with different fonts. Um, there's a picture of lovely Natalie and one of her initial clothing sketches for the brand. Um, wanted it to feel really authentic and fit with the spirit of what she was trying to do. And once that was done, we were good to go. And I was like, right, now I've got to chuck this in to the logo presentation. So let's jump into that and I'll take you through what that ended up looking like. Okay, so let's jump straight in to the brand identity proposal that I've paired once I was finally happy with all of the design elements. So Thank goodness for templates because this didn't take me that long to actually pull together or one side whipped up a couple of mock-ups and I was happy with the overall look. So I jumped straight in by just recapping the mood board always just to remind the client of where we were and the kinds of visuals that were very important to us. I then hopped straight into presenting the logo. Now Typically, it's good advice to present the logo just black and white um, so that they can see all the features. But personally, I've found that often it can be off-putting for clients to see that first because it's like, oh, is that all? Um, because let's be honest, we, we judge things by how they look. And oftentimes, if you present them the most boring representation of the logo without any context whatsoever, it's very difficult for them to connect emotionally to the design. And so what I always do is I try to add a little bit of oomph and a little bit of pizzazz to the initial presentation of the main logo. And then I show them the boring versions later on. So I did a little bit of a copper embossing here just to show off a little bit of the concept. I then walk in to actually breaking down the logo and the various aspects, explaining what is involved. And I do this for all the different logos. And then the emblem was a particularly important one for me because... In the strategy, we discussed that Eli Arby was a brand that was for multifaceted, dynamic and multi-passionate women who, you know, have many different facets to them. And this emblem was a visual representation of that. And so in the rotating of the symbol and looking at it from any angle, it still looks right and it still looks good. This brand was a celebration of 
women who can do anything and who can be anything and who are more than just one thing and they can be mothers and they can work and they can do all of these different things. It was very important for Natalie to represent that because that's who she is and that is the type of woman she is trying to attract into the brand. Women who appreciate doing all sorts of different things, who are interested in a whole bunch of different things, who are not just defined by one role, etc. So, you know, even though the brand doesn't shout all of that from the rooftop, that was really the concept. And so it was important that the emblem represent that. So I made sure to spend some serious time unpacking that for her. I then showed her a couple of other logos and then we jumped into the mockups. So it's very important, obviously, to showcase to your client what the brand is going to look like in the real world. And this is where mockups come in handy. And now it's very important to note that, yes, this does take more work. It does take a bit more time to prepare these assets. And sometimes it can be quite high risk in the sense that if, for example, they don't like the work, you've then done all of this stuff for almost no reason and you've got to go back and start again. But let me tell you something. Ever since I started doing this process where I've built out a brand in more detail and I've really added structure to it right from the beginning and I've added all this storytelling to it, I very rarely get massive pushback from clients. We usually get approval within the first or second round and usually by this time I've worked with it for so long and I'm so ingrained in it and I'm so confident in the concept that there's very few changes and I'm happy to present the single concept. Now this does take practice and it takes time to get really good at listening to your client really well so that you can produce something that works on the first round. So, you know, if you're in the beginning of your career and you've tried the one concept method a few times and it hasn't worked, stick with it and just make sure that you are building out your process in the earlier stages so that you're really listening to your client, you're understanding what sort of things are super important to them. You know, I realized very early on from Natalie that while she wanted the brand to have elegance and class, she did not want it to look girly. And so that was a very key balance for me when it came to creating these elements. So we jumped straight into doing a couple of mock-ups where I pulled the pattern out, did the badge. We've got a shopper bag with the logo on it, with some tissue paper, the embossing, the logo over an image, and then of course the actual clothing label, which I thought would be really, really helpful for her to visualize what the emblem and badge would look like on her actual items. We then moved into doing a couple of other mock-ups, so tissue paper designs using the logos that we've already done. So, you know, no extra work here in, in, in that sense. Um, and then typography, color, secondary color. So it was very important because it's a clothing brand. We needed lots of color to work with. So whether it's the range itself or whether it's online or on social media, we just needed more colors to work with than the sort of very muted, limited base palette. So we brought in the greens and showed her what those look like. Now, initially, I was actually a bit worried about working with all of these colors at once. But in hindsight, it's actually worked really, really well for the brand. And I'm really enjoying having all these colors to work with on all the supporting materials that we've been doing for her. And that was pretty much it. So it was a short, sharp and sweet presentation. Sometimes I find, you know, it's actually easier to make it a little bit more condensed for the client. So she's not sitting there watching a 20 minute long Loom video or something like that. And she can go through it or they can go through it um, as quickly as they need to. And I sent that off to her and presented it to her and was so nervous about her feedback, but she sent me a voice note. And I think for anybody who has presented creative work to a client, you will know this feeling very, very well. It doesn't matter how confident you are in the concept. It doesn't matter how confident you are in the idea or how happy you are with the design. As soon as you send something for approval to somebody, the imposter syndrome kicks in. And I, I was so nervous that she wasn't going to like it. But she sent me a voice note and she was in tears and she was so happy with everything. And she said we'd nailed it and she was really excited to move forward into the next round. So there were a couple of very small tweaks that we had to make. But other than that, we were done with the design phase and we could now move on to finalizing the collateral 
and finalizing her brand stationery and applying the sort of the brand look and feel to everything else that needed to be done. So let's jump into that part next. So now that we've gone through the entire sort of development of the project, what actually happened is we then took a bit of a break because she needed to go into finalizing the production of the actual products. And anybody who's worked in clothing or product development knows that this can take a while. And so what we did is once the branding was done and everything was sort of applied as it needed to be, we moved into sort of a bit of a standby mode where I was working on some sort of sticker designs for her and I was working on some social media stuff for her and I was doing a bit of other things, but we took a bit of a break to also strategize what we're going to do about her website. We decided that in the early days of the business, until we could gain a bit more momentum, that a basic sort of Shopify site was going to do the trick. So we didn't go hugely custom on the, shop, on the, on the site. We built her a basic Shopify website. We used a template. We, we got all the beautiful customization up. The website, in my opinion, I think looks great. And I think it's a testament to the fact that you don't, as a startup business owner, you don't need to break the bank all the time on everything fully custom. And it functions beautifully. And the user experience is easy and effortless. There is really no need to spend a massive fortune. There are not a huge amount of products that are live at the moment. As more develop, the website will also grow and we will look at updating and customizing as we go along. But we were very happy with where it was at. So what ended up happening then is, is that a couple of months later, she came back and we were able to sort of finalize the brand. And this is where it started getting really exciting for me as the designer because I started to see the brand really come to life. So just a quick couple of snapshots about where we're at now. We sort of did a bunch of stickers for her, which she uses on her packaging. And here is a quick little preview of the illustration that I did. There were a couple of others as well, um, where we characterized sort of the Eddie Arby woman, um, quite fun with some illustrations. Then we have all of these cool stickers or, or labels that go into the back of the clothes. So that was amazing. Then we've got these labels that go onto the back of the clothing and they've all got like a different saying on them. So you look great today. You look on par today. Ha ha. It's four o'clock somewhere and actually you can and you have great style and it's a great day to be you. So the brand is very affirming for, for women and it's just a nice little sort of something something. And then this was very cool for me was to watch the pattern I'd actually designed come to life on products themselves. Now, this was very, very cool. And it was cool to see her sort of testing the colors and working out what was going to work. But there's the brand emblem and there's the beautiful leaf pattern that I illustrated and designed actually showing up on the products themselves, which is the coolest thing in the world. And then we moved into sort of art directing proper photo shoots. And with very little guidance, Natalie was able to sort of take this to a professional photographer and go and get some really amazing beautifully lit natural shots of her and some of her Ellie Arby ladies wearing the clothing items and obviously there's a lot more to show and a lot more to come if you guys are interested in looking at how the brand is showing up please give Ellie Arby a follow on Instagram and have a little look around at what she's got on offer if any of you are in the United States and you happen to enjoy golf then definitely check them out I can take seriously testify that the clothing is incredibly made beautifully hand crafted her attention to detail is impeccable and it was really quite an adventure getting to work on this brand and looking at all of it come to life now we have also managed to work on some of the social media and i have helped her with some of the design and it's been really great to sort of have a hands-on feel with the brand on an ongoing basis we've done some mailers for her and it's really been amazing to watch how this brand has evolved from the beginning inquiry where there was nothing but an idea and an illustration on a piece of paper to a fully fledged and fully designed brand if you guys found this helpful in any way then please let us know down in the comments if you've got any questions about the brand development process and how it happened and how it took place any details that I've left out that you want to know more about, drop it in the comments below and I'll be sure to reply to you. And if you want to see more content like this, also let us know. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one. Cheers.